morning, everyone, and welcome to Brookings. I'm Michael Hamlin with the Foreign Policy Program here, along with my colleague Melanie Sisson. We are thrilled to have the Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, General C.Q. Brown, with us today to speak about priorities in American defense planning, the state of the Air Force, and the state of the world more generally. It's really a privilege to have the general here. What I'd like to do is just say a couple words of introduction. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, know him and know of him and his remarkable career, but I'd like to give a proper Brookings welcome, and then I'll ask a few questions, then Melanie will ask a few, and then we'll turn things over to you. We thought till about 11.15 for this discussion. General Brown hails from the great state of Texas. He also went to college there at Texas Tech. I believe that's also where a young man named Patrick Mahomes went to college, sure. and uh, graduated in 1984 in the ROTC program in civil engineering. Uh, has been in the U.S. Air Force ever since, uh, F-16 pilot, 3,000 hours of flying, uh, also command positions at the Weapons School, at Central Command, at Pacific Air Forces, prior to becoming the Chief of Staff of the Air Force in the summer of 2020. Uh, there are a couple other things I really am struck by in his remarkable resume, and one of them is he was a federal fellow at the Institute for Defense Analyses, which is a place I had the privilege of spending a summer one year. They do hardcore defense analysis at IDA, and I think it's one of the reasons that in addition to thinking about fancy fighter jets and other things that F-16 pilots often do, that this chief of staff thinks a lot about things like command control, satellite survivability, air base survivability, and some of the nitty gritty that's crucial to how the military functions and how it also deals with the uh, concerns about potential preemptive attack, survivability in high-end combat, and all the things that we know we have to think about with the national defense strategy of 2022 in this period of peer competition and rivalry with Russia and China. So with all that said, would you please join me in welcoming General Brown to Brookings. <laughs> General, thank you for being here. I wanted to begin, before we get into some of those technology and innovation and, and uh, national defense strategy kind of questions, with just uh, your take on the state of the Air Force today, and I'm thinking about readiness, the state of recruiting and retention and people, families, also uh, combat preparedness in terms of training and mission-capable rates. Start with the nitty-gritty question on just how are things going at that kind of day-to-day -day level right now from your vantage point, sir. You know, one, one of the areas I'd highlight, first of all, thanks again for the opportunity to be here. Um, you know, what I look at is the Air Force is uh, our, our, my responsibility is to make sure we're as ready as possible. And uh, it's, it's, ne it's a never-ending uh, aspect of the work I have to do. And so I can never sit, slap the table and say, okay, we're done being ready. And so from that perspective, uh, wh what I do see is the, uh, from a broader standpoint on capability, uh, I feel pretty confident in the aspect of what we were able to do with the NDAA for uh, the fiscal year 23 as well as appropriations bill to make some progress to make the transition to the future. And so from that aspect, I've been pleased as we uh, started to work with 24 uh, wrapping up the 24 uh, deliberations inside of the building and uh, to preside to the president's budget. I feel pretty good about that one as well because I think we're making the case of why the Air Force needs to transition. Uh, from a readiness standpoint, um, you know, there's an area that I, I do, you know, the reason why I want to modernize is because uh, the, the average age of our aircraft is about 30 years old. Uh, most of the aircraft we operate today um, were around during Desert Shield, Desert Storm when I was a captain. And what we're finding is um, they're breaking more often, it's taking longer to fix, and it's costing more to, to maintain those. And so it's, it's that part of the transition. From a people front, um, when I look at retention, our retention is really about where it uh, was pre-COVID. I mean, there's a little bit of a uh, COVID bump, but we're on average about 90%, uh, both on officer and enlisted. So from that aspect, uh, I think we still provide great opportunities for those that want to serve. Um, I think the key part of retention is how we take care of our and families. Uh, it's not just what we do. I talk about quality of service and quality of life. Quality of service, when, just, when our airmen come to work each day, we provide them all the resources and tools to execute what the nation's asked them to do to the best of our ability. Quality of life is how we take care of them and their families in our downtime um, and how we work in our communities. And uh, I have to applaud my wife, Shireen, who uh, started a program with other spouses, kind of a grassroots, called Five and Thrive. And it's the five key areas that impact military families, not just Air Force families, but military families. Child care, uh, education, housing, health care, and spouse employment. And so they've got a small group that's uh, pretty powerful in approaching those areas. And so, uh, and the last one I'll hit on is, is on recruiting. Um, I think all the services, you've, you, as you've all seen, is, are uh, having some challenges in recruiting. 
Uh, we met our goal for, uh, for uh, 2022. Um, we're working towards 2023. And uh, one of the things we did in 2022 is we uh, dipped into our delayed enlistment program, uh, which is our, kind of our, uh, our buffer as we go forward. And the, what we go, as we go into 23, uh, I think we'll, we'll make our goal on the active side, maybe a little more challenging on the, uh, on the reserve component side because of the retention piece. Right. When you retain, they don't affiliate over at the reserve component. So uh, they're, they're, it's a good, you know, it's two sides of the coin. Right. There's some good and bad to that. But I also think the thing we have to do is uh, how we better connect um, with those that might aspire to, um, to serve. The one thing I believe, young people only aspire to be what they see. And uh, as we have gotten smaller, um, you know, compared to where we were in Desert Shield, Desert Storm to where we are today, the number of bases we have are smaller. Um, after 9-11, uh, that we made it very difficult for people to get onto our bases. And uh, what I've asked our, our leadership teams to do is open up your bases, get to know, you know, engage with the communities, not just with young people, but with their influencers as well. And then we just got to look at some other thing, areas is the aspect of um, do we have any barriers um, to those that want to serve. And so we're going through and looking at a number of our different policies that were good, you know, maybe 5, 10, 15 years ago. But as we look at today and today's young people, are some, there are there some things that we need to take a look at? You know, tattoos is one of those. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot more people have tattoos today than when I was growing up. So we got to think about that. When we got to meet some of these young people where they are and, uh, and think differently about how we connect with them. And uh, that's a key area that we're working on to uh, broaden the perspective and show them the opportunities, because there's great opportunities. And the last thing I'll share on this is when I talk to uh, our folks, and we also talk about why people leave the, the military. And I ask them, those that are around, why did you stay? And for many of us, it's because we love serving. We've had great opportunities. And I can tell you from my own perspective, when I, when I read my own biography, I have to pinch myself with all the opportunities I've had. It's almost like a dream, because it's kind of hard for me to put it into perspective for me even personally because of the opportunities that the military has provided me. Thank you. Uh, one more follow-up on readiness, and then I want to start talking about modernization and mm -hmm. national defense strategy. And uh, I realize that there's all sorts of different types of aircraft in the Air Force. So there's no single number you could give me for mission-capable rates. But in, in overall terms, have despite the problem you mentioned of an aging fleet and delayed maintenance, have mission-capable rates on balance been improving over this last sort of five-year mini-defense buildup that we've had, first with President Trump, then with President Biden, and with Congress adding, of course? Uh, or don't you necessarily see that progress because the fleet is so old and getting older, and we just can't quite keep up with the pace of things? So I know mission-capable rates are often individually classified, but if you could give us some overall sense of whether they're getting better, I'd be curious. Well, I think it's pretty balanced. And one of the areas we've also looked at, not just the mission capable rates, but we've also used a, another metric of aircraft availability. Because the mission capable rates will be for the aircraft that you have on the ramp. But we also want to look at the availability for those that are, um, because if you think the, of the whole life cycle of the aircraft or a platform, it's not only what's you know, assigned to the units on the ramp there, but also what's in depot. And how long uh, aircraft, British aircraft in depot. And the old the aircraft is, it's just like your car, you know, the order it is when you take it into the shop, not only do they find a, fix the thing you're looking at, but they also may find something else. And that's the other aspect as we look at aircraft ability. So I, I would tell you it's, it's fairly balanced uh, uh, across the board um, when you look at mission capable rates. Uh, but it, it is a challenge. And uh, what I want to do is you know, take it off the backs of our airmen because they're working really hard. Um, they do some amazing things. I'm, I'm very extremely proud of the work that they do on a day-to-day -day basis to be thought, you know, creative. And, you know, one, one example I use is with the adaptive manufacturing to take a look at how do we build parts that, you know, we may have a diminishing uh, supply source and how do we solve some of those problems. And so uh, a lot of hard work, um, but I, I, I'd say it's pretty balanced. So if I could, I'd like to now get into your priorities as chief for innovation and also with the national defense strategy of last fall and just ask you to begin wherever, chief, you'd like to in explaining the central thrust of what you're trying to do with the Air Force and how it's going. So you've talked, there's some slogans and some big ideas associated with your tenure as chief going back to the, the Trump era national defense strategy. Uh, you talk about accelerate, change, or lose. Uh, you've talked about concepts like agile combat employment where you're trying to be able to use more bases in different places to reduce vulnerability or dependency on any one in a place like Okinawa. And of course, there are a number of technologies 
hypersonics, AI, all this stuff is in the mix. I'm sure we'll talk about a number of these over the course of the next hour. But if, if you would just begin, please, with your overall philosophy and what you're trying to do, the, the biggest idea that you're trying to push in the Air Force and how it's going. Uh, I think the biggest thing is accelerate, change, or lose. Um, and to be comfortable with make, drive and change. Uh, I really believe that the, um, you know, having spent quite a bit of time with the United States Central Command, uh, at the headquarters, at the uh, uh, Air Operations Center in, in al uh, I just felt as I came into uh, this position that um, as the 2018 National Defense, Stra National Defense Strategy came out, we, were, we need to look in how we stay ahead of where our adversaries are. Uh, we, we are the most respected Air Force in the world. Um, I want to stay that way. And so the big idea is really how do we make sure that we are doing things based on the threat? Um, and, uh, and looking at the threat and look at our capabilities associated with the threat, which means there's areas that we uh, um, have to make a transition to the future, and that's, that is where the challenge is. Um, the area that I look at is, you know, for the Air Force, we have more classified programs than, than any other service. The Department of the Air Force does. And it's hard to make a transition uh, to let something go, to retire something, if you can't see what the future looks like. And so uh, I spend a lot of time engaging with members and their staff to one, classified briefings, but provide them unclassified talking points associated with what we're trying to get done to paint the picture of what our overall capabilities. And so that, to me, is the, uh, I would say, really the big idea. And that big idea has not changed since, I, since I've come in. Uh, I would also say, though, um, I've got a great partner with Secretary Kendall. Uh, I'm a, I've been an operator my entire career. Uh, I have zero acquisition experience, but I've gotten the gentleman who's written the book on acquisition. And he understands and how he was able to come in with the operational imperatives and between the two of us to be able to drive ourselves as a, uh, as a department of the Air Force in some key areas to drive capability and then to do the analysis associated with it to make the case. That, so it's not based just on um, emotion. or it, It's done on facts and analysis of what it is we need to be able to do to move forward. And that's been helpful to, to make the case for we're, we're, how we need to transition as an Air Force. And I've been very pleased at uh, the fact that we, the two of us with the rest of the leadership, spent a lot of time diving into the details. And uh, as someone told me, when, in things I'm interested in, everybody else is fascinated in. The fact that myself and the Secretary spent as much time on some of these areas actually is a forcing function to help us drive the change to where we need to go for the future. So. Uh, from that aspect, I've been, I've been uh, very pleased. But we've got a long ways to go, um, and uh, we, we can't rest on our laurels. So in terms of a long ways to go and all the things you're, you're trying to do, there are a lot of questions I'd like to ask specifically, but maybe a broad way to ask. I, I'm, I'm struck by your use of the term lose. Like, you know, there's a real risk of defeat, not to mention of if we fight Russia or China, I would argue we'd already lost just when the war, the very fact of the war beginning and deterrence failing. But... What could make us lose in the greatest probability in your eyes? In other words, is it the vulnerability of key systems that we depend on, the command and control, the bases, or is it not modernizing and becoming more lethal fast enough? I realize you're going to say all the above are important, and certainly lethality is crucial, and resilience and survivability are crucial. But if there's one thing that keeps you up at night, is it that we have exposed vulnerable bases and command and control systems that an adversary could be tempted to try to attack, put us on our back long enough to achieve a regional aim? Or is it that we don't have enough high-end combat aircraft or munitions to deliver a lethal punch? You know, I, I know I use the term accelerate, change, or lose, but I'll tell you, personally, professionally, I do not play for second place. I don't play to lose. I play to win. And so what I'm trying to do is put, do everything we can across the whole spectrum of not only capability but capacity to put ourselves in the best position, one, to deter, because the goal is never go to conflict. But if we do go to conflict, then I want to be in a very good position to operate. And so it's the, uh, I'll, I'll just, as I hit maybe a, a few areas, is um, at the operational prayers actually held a pretty good framework yeah. for, you know, how we look at our resilient space architecture, how we're able to do command and control, whether it's a joint all-domain command and control or advanced battle management system, which is the Air, Department of the Air Force's contribution to joint all domain and command and control, uh, tracking moving targets at scale, um, looking at families of systems with crude and uncrewed uh, platforms with uh, next generation air dominance, um, how we have resilient basing, and, and then how we posture ourselves to, uh, uh, with the B-21 as well as how we posture ourselves for, for conflict. 
And so um, I don't know if there's any one that I would just say this is the one. Um, but I do think we've got to make sure that we're raising all those at the same level. The resilient basing is, uh, is something we probably have spent more time on in Europe during the Cold War than out in the Indo-Pacific. And I think it's a combination of uh, um, active and passive uh, systems that uh, play into, um, in, into that resilient basing. Uh, that's why agile combat employment is so important um, uh, for the Air Force, to be lighter, leaner, more agile. The more places we operate, the more places that our adversaries need to think about uh, countering us. And um, I think it's also the mindset for our airmen. Uh, we've gotten used to going to the Middle East where we have big bases that are already established and you just show up. Um, we're going to go places uh, potentially in the future where it's, you're starting from scratch. And you can't bring everything, but how do you operate in an environment um, and uh, be able to make decisions about having to call back to, you know, all the way back up to the headquarters. And that, that's what I want to instill in our airmen, that they have the confidence to do the things that the nation's asked us to do without having um, a lot of oversight, you know, provide intent and let them go execute. So it's, it's a really a combination of, uh, of things I would, uh, I would lay out versus just one. Do you think that in modern warfare, bases can be made inherently survivable, or do you feel like the offense just has too much of an advantage and you're essentially doing you know, damage mitigation with the agile combat employment concept? I think there's a bit of both. I mean, you, you've got to, um, you know, the goal here by having agile combat employment is to show that uh, we have a credible combat capability that we can move around, shoot, prove that how we exercise and how we uh, move capably around the world on a day-to-day -day basis so you don't get to a conflict. But we also want to make sure we are postured. And so there is the aspect of, um, you know, when I was much younger, we, we d dispersed the aircraft on, on bases. What we're trying to do with the agile complaints is disperse it across bases so you don't have all your capability on one location but move, be able to move it around. And, and we had used in uh, PACAF or Pacific Air Forces a hub-and-spoke process. You may have a major hub that has most of your defensive capability, but, you're, you know, you may have six spokes but only operate at three rotating um, throughout to keep our adversaries guessing. And so we want to cause, you know, there's already going to be frog and friction in a conflict, but what you want to cause even more frog and friction for our adversary um, by, uh, by being uh, agile with agile combat employment. You mentioned uh, JADC2, Joint All Domain Command and Control. And I remember just before the COVID shutdown three years ago, we had an event here with, uh, with civilian defense scholars, I think Rebecca Grant and Tom Earhart, talking about J JADC2. And so it was a priority even before you became chief. I wondered if you could, for the general audience, explain a little bit what it is and then tell us how it's going and anything, any, any key innovations that are related to JADC2 programmatically that you want to weave into that discussion. I would be curious. You know, uh, early in the process with the JADC2, there was those that talked about connecting every sensor to every shooter. And uh, I really felt it was more correcting the right sensors to the right shooter at the right time. And, and JADC2 is, you know, just think about our, how we operate in our day-to-day -day lives when you carry around a smartphone. No matter where you are, you don't care what, uh, you, you may be paying one uh, uh, telecommunication company to, for your cell phone plan, but when you travel around, it connects to whoever. And you can get access to all your data to be able to make decisions or search the internet or get to your banking account or whatever. It's the same kind of concept um, to be able to do that, be able to get the data put it into a cloud, and then be able to access the data through applications and not do it service by service by service. So we don't have an Air Force kill chain or um, have a Navy kill chain, a Marine Corps kill chain, uh, Army kill chain. It's how do you move that data around to determine who is the best to actually execute against a target or to use that you know, to be able to make a decision. The, the challenge we have as we start this transition is each of the services have invested in their various command and control systems and how do you then align those. And, and the goal here is not to, that I have to connect you know, every airplane to every tank, for example, but how do I get my data off my airplanes to an area that if a ground commander or a maritime commander needs that information, they can pull it. Um, if we have some level of commonality in how we move data, that is probably the key point. And uh, I will tell you, we are, we are making a lot more progress because I think over you know, when I first came into this position, um, it was still kind of a maybe PowerPoint deep. Right. Um, I, we have spent a lot more time with 
the other services. Uh, back in June, I hosted an event with the other service chiefs to go, okay, let's, let's talk about this because you've got to be going the same way, same day. And it wasn't so much what we accomplished in the, the you know, two to three hour meeting we had, it was what it did to energize our staffs to start communicating. Um, and then uh, I think the last thing I'd say on this is the work that we've done to identify um, uh, Brigadier General Luke Cropsey and Dr. Brian Tipton to be the acquisition technical leads to actually bail out their architecture. And the way that Secretary Kimmel's described it is we need to build a, uh, a, a very simple house because we had all these visions of palaces all over the place of what they were going to look like. And we need to build a very simple house. And uh, the, what I built onto that is described once we build that house, then you can customize your house you know, by adding a pool in the backyard if you want, above ground and below ground. You want a circular driveway versus a straight driveway. You want a garden in the back. So we got to build a basic building block and then from here we can start to expand. And we've got pretty good alignment as we work with the other services to be able to do this. A key part of this is gonna be the space aspect to be able to move the data, which is why the Space Force is so important to be able to lay out that, that architecture. Um, because that's the other part. We, I don't think we really, operation, we knew what we wanted, but we didn't have the deep thoughts on the architecture, the technical aspects of this. Again, this is where Secretary Kendall with his background was able to help focus us a bit more uh, at least in the Department of the Air Force, and working very closely with the other services in uh, OSD and uh, the joint staff to, to move this along. So just two more questions for me, General, then I'll hand off to Melanie. And the first uh, is about munitions. And speaking of things that I know to be important to Secretary Kendall, I've heard him speak on this topic before. And there are times where the U.S. military or the Department of Defense at large and working with Congress have maybe not prioritize things like munitions enough because we've worried more about the big platforms. Obviously, the Ukraine conflict as well as the competition with China have forced us to think a little more about munitions, both in terms of stockpiles and in terms of the supply chain. So I wondered if you could give us sort of a state of the Air Force snapshot on, on how it's looking on the munitions front. Do we have anything close to the number that we might need for high-end conflict? That's question one or part one. And then part two, how are we doing at making the supply chain a little more dependable and, and you know, fixing any of those shortfalls we may have? Right. You know, <clears throat> excuse me. For the, for the Air Force, we are sitting a, uh, a pretty good spot for most of them. There's, there's, I mean, there's a handful of ones that we, um, as you look at, uh, I think about not only capability but capacity and how you have that balance. Because you can have some highly capable weapons that are very expensive, but you may not have the capacity. Um, and that's why this part about JASC2 to be able to do moving targets at scale is really important because otherwise you can have a, uh, a bunch of targets, no munitions, um, or a bunch of munitions and, and no targets because you, you can't move the information. But um, we, uh, by and large, and then we're doing you know, deeper dives on these to take a really hard look at where we are from a munition standpoint. So I, I feel um, pretty good, but I know there's, there's a handful, a couple of different munitions without getting into details that um, we want to make sure we continue to uh, move forward on. I think COVID has taught us a, a few things collectively about uh, supply chains. And, uh, and as I look at the defense and industrial base, there's things that we've, as a department uh, and OSD, has looked at of ensuring that we are um, a posture. And uh, that, that's an area I think we, uh, we will continue to work through to be able to ensure that we have the capacity to move forward. Because if you go to a conflict, then you're, you're Rate, just like if you go back and look at what happened during World War II, we'll have to, and we need to understand that as we go forward. Uh, we've talked about how we've been uh, very uh, efficient over the years, and in some cases, um, to be able to move forward, um, we have to be probably less efficient. But I think we're also in a different place because of uh, technology where you're able to do um, with some of the digital engineering type aspects and modular capabilities to be able to, to do things a bit faster. And I've been able to chance to uh, visit some of our industry partners to see how they've actually are looking at automation and the ability to build weapons uh, uh, a bit faster than we have in the past. So um, it, we, we're in a decent spot, but uh, what I don't want to do is just in a decent spot. I want to make sure you know, we, we have a, uh, an overwhelming advantage. Thank you. And now <clears> I <throat> wanted to, for my last question, ask a little bit about this is sort of a more synthesizing question, but ask about time frame for preparing for potential conflict. And again, you and I have both already said today that if the war happens, that's already a failure of deterrence and not the goal. But there have been a lot of people speaking about what time frame they think a Chinese attack on Taiwan in particular might be the most likely. 
General Minahan spoke recently to that and suggested 2025. Earlier, uh, Admiral Davidson, the former combatant commander for Indo-Pacific Command, had talked about how he thought Xi Jinping was focused more on 2027. Xi Jinping himself has said he wants a military that's readier and more capable by 2027, implying that he might want to use it. Uh, other people, I think Secretary Blinken has even weighed in on this topic and the U.S. intelligence community. So I wanted to ask you, from a U.S. Air Force point of view, since your job is to train and prepare the force, and therefore you have to think about the near term, the medium term, and the long term, do you have a time frame in mind for when the Chinese threat is the greatest or most acute? And do you think that China is likely to attack Taiwan? Or is this really, is war likely? Or is it just, you know, something that heaven forbid we have to worry about, but really should be able to deter if we get our ducks in a row? Well, let me start off with, uh, um, I can't predict the future. But I can, I can shape it. And I shape the future by being ready. And, and that's, that's where I, I look at things. I don't see that uh, conflict is imminent or inevitable. And the goal is to avoid it. Um, and so not knowing when things may, might occur, uh, my goal is to be ready you know, today, tomorrow, next week, next year, next decade, and set ourselves as an Air Force to have the capability and capacity um, to be able to provide options for the President. And we're very close with our joint teammates and with our allies and partners. And uh, you know, those that, uh, you know, as you mentioned, uh, there's been speculation. That, that speculation not, is not necessarily helpful. Uh, I've been disappointed by some of the comments that have been made uh, associated with it, because it takes away from what we're really trying to get to do is to make sure we're going to be ready. And, and that's where the real focus is, to be ready and think about it with a sense of urgency so we don't wake up one day and say, w I wish we had done something, when we can kind of see uh, maybe some trend lines. And so that's, that's where I really think about uh, from, from, is my responsibilities, you know, less so to try to predict anything, but the goal is to make sure we're as ready as possible no matter when, and really pay attention to the geostrategic environment as well. So uh, we, we're doing the right things to be ready and, and not, uh, you know, as some folks say, you know, fighting the last war. We've got to be thinking about how uh, conflict might evolve in the future with the changing nature of war and make ourselves ready. Thank you. Now in passing the baton to Melanie, let me just say two things about her. Uh, she's, a, she's, she's a senior fellow or a fellow here at Brookings and a scholar that's achieving amazing things with Barry Blackman. She wrote and co-edited a book called Military Coercion, which is about the use of U.S. military force since the end of the Cold War, what kinds of deployments and operations are successful for enhancing deterrence uh, and which are less so. And also, anybody who hadn't seen her last Tuesday House Armed Service Committee testimony, the first big open committee hearing of the 118th Congress. I recommend it very highly. Uh, it was magnificent testimony, and she made it through four grueling hours of Q&A with almost every single member of the committee present. So, Melanie, over to you. Well, thank you, Mike. That's a very uh, generous introduction. I think I need to bring you around with me everywhere I go from now on. And since you did, I'm going to actually take, do the reverse and remind the audience um, that Mike's newest book is available for purchase in the Brookings Bookstore and is a great, we are told, Valentine's gift if your special <laughs> someone is really interested in military history for the modern strategist. It would be the perfect thing. So keep that in mind on your way out, but thank you, Mike. And Chief, thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, I wanted to sort of go back up to a big picture question to a certain extent, and it has to do with, we hear a lot of you know buzzwords um, innovation, modernization, transformation, you've tended to use words like accelerate and transition. And so I'm interested to know if, as you were coming into this role, you had ideas about whether what is really needed is transformation or if it's something uh, that you know our, our foundation, our fundamentals are very solid and what we need to do is adapt and evolve. Um, if there's a balance between those two, certainly I'd be interested to hear that. I, I think it's the... Uh... The latter. Our foundation is, is pretty good, uh, but we just need to figure out how to evolve. And the reason, part of the reason I say that is, um, you know, from my experience working in combat commands, you know, uh, I was a deputy director of operations at the United States Central Command, deputy air component commander, air component commander, then the deputy commander of the command. And I could see that uh, for the combatant commands, they live in the now. Um, and they don't, they think about the future but not as much as a service chief. As a matter of fact, when I interviewed for this position, I sat down with Secretary Esper. He played, played me against myself. 
that I was the Air Component Commander for Indo-PACOM, and now you're going to be the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, so it was an issue. He goes, okay, how, how would you do this? I said, we need to put all the cards on the table, and we need to actually assess how to move forward, which is why I think about it. It's more of a transition, because we've got to have capabilities to make sure we're ready today as we transition to the future, which means we can't drop everything and say, hey, we, we don't need this, and move directly to the future and start trying to acquire things. We've got to make a transition and do it smoothly. Uh, which means there's going to be some give and take uh, as, as we do that. Also, the aspect of accelerate change or lose, I also know that there's a lot of research and development that's done outside of the Department of Defense these days. And how do we bring that into the department more smoothly? One of the actions, I have four action orders to go with accelerate change or lose. One of those is action order B on bureaucracy. We have a lot of it. And so part of that process is how do we break down some of these barriers? Because I think in some cases we have the authorities to do things, but we've got a habit pattern of how we operate that we need to break out of and empower those that actually are willing to um, challenge the status quo. I mean, that's kind of how I've operated throughout my career. I'm willing to challenge the status quo until, some myself, until we come back and go, well, what we're doing is, is good. But you always want to go back and validate, because I really believe the facts and assumptions based on the decisions we make, all change. And that's why it's really important that I think about the threat and the threat changes. As the threat changes, we've also got to be adaptable enough to actually do some change. You know, you can't do big, big swings, but you've got to be able to swing a little bit in one direction or another. And are those areas where you came in thinking that the Air Force really needs to accelerate change, are those things that you saw coming in what you discovered to be your priority areas once you were in the seat? And are they the same for you now? Have you seen that change over time as well, where you think that that pressing and urgent need for an accelerated transition is? Um, it's, it's changed a little bit. I guess the one thing I've realized, um, you know, I, I had not served in the Pentagon as a general officer. Uh, last time I served, I was, a, I was a colonel. And as an operator, you always want things faster. Um, I, I probably my eyes were probably bigger than, you know, my aspiration to be able to go fast was probably bigger than I need. But I also knew as I got mentored by my predecessors, you're going to have to pick some things that are for your projects. And this is a cultural shift. And a cultural shift does not happen in a year or two or maybe even four years. But the goal was to set a foundation to start moving forward. And, and that, even as I did the action orders, I've done modifications to the action orders because there's some things I knew I wanted to be able to do and then as, you're, you know, as you uh, lay things out and they meet up with reality, um, you have to adjust. You know, and a couple of examples is from the time I was being told I was being considered, had my interview with uh, President Trump, two major things happened that I wasn't expecting, COVID and the death of George Floyd. Okay, and, there's all, and, and you can say the invasion into Ukraine. These, there's things that happened during your tenure that you got a great plan, and then that was the other thing at Mentorline. You can have a great plan, but there's going to be something that's going to happen that you didn't predict that's going to adjust how you're going to go. So you, it, it changes maybe the pace, but the intent is still the same. And same question for as you look at the joint force. Are there areas that you recognize now that the joint force together needs to accelerate change? Are there particular areas of priority that you've either had identified prior to coming in to being chief or that you see much more up close and personal in this role? Well, I think, <clears throat> I, think I do think there was the aspect of the joint war fighting concept and that it's really helping us to bring the joint force closer together. And you, you got to think about, you know, all the way back to Goldwater Nichols and where we weren't so joint. And I think we can always continue to improve our, our joint operations. I also believe it's not just the joints that combine operations with our allies and partners. And again, this is based on my personal experience, because um, most of my time as a general officer, I've been overseas or serving uh, with allies and partners at commands that were focused overseas. And because of that, I've built a lot of relationships and understand the, the aspect of being able to work with allies and partners, which is just as important as working with our joint teammates. And there is some give and take as you do that. Um, but we're, we're better together than trying to do things separately or saying we're going to go U.S. only or Air Force only, um, because we all have different skill sets and uh, expertise that, that make us an outstanding team. Um, and the joint war fighting concept is actually a way for us to coalesce a bit more of that to help look at uh, some, some of the critical capabilities that are required for the joint force. And then as we start to resource, how do we determine 
which of the services takes the lead, or how do we share across the services so we have uh, a range of capabilities to address uh, our oper future operational scenarios. I really appreciated your description um, in response to Mike's question about JADC2, and in particular because I think you highlighted just how data-centric yeah. and demanding that a system like that actually is. Um, Deputy Secretary of Defense uh, Kathleen Hicks has emphasized the importance of data generally in the department's uh, operations, both on the enterprise side of the house and on the, the mission side. Um, and I'm, you also mentioned that you rely a, a lot on facts and, and analysis. And so if you can share your assessment of the quality of Air Force data today, if you've seen initiatives undertaken that you think are accelerating change in data in the right direction? Well, we have. Matter of fact, um, I think COVID also helped us because as we went into COVID, we were all trying to, across the Air Force, pull data together to be able to figure out what was going on as we went into the pandemic. In, in, internal to the Pentagon, they had about 30 different efforts, all uh, decentralized. And what we tried to do under uh, the previous Vice Chief of Staff, uh, uh, General Wilson, we set up a Project Brown Heron. And Project Brown Heron is really how do we then start to look at our key parts of our data fabric. And we've laid out really six areas where we put our data now. As a matter of fact, I have a demo with them uh, later this week. So I think we've made a, quite a bit of progress um, in that regard. I'm doing the same thing for talent management uh, for our General Officer Corps. Um, I'm a huge NFL fan. I've been to several mm -hmm. facilities. I've watched how they do the player personnel. I want to be able to do the same thing, at least at the General Officer level, to start and then be able to go to a, deeper into the Air Force. And what we're doing is pulling in from very existing data sources and having the right people who understand how to do this work with us. Um, and uh, so I do think we're making good progress there. And having met... Um, We've got at least, a, there's a major that's on our staff who's a PhD in data science. I was at the Black Engineer of the Year Awards uh, on Friday, met a young lady who was going to come in the Air Force whose degree is in data science. And I said, when I was in college, data science was not even a major you could select. That's the part of where we are starting, I think, collectively making a shift in the importance of data. And I think we're all starting to realize how important the data is. The other part I'm concerned with that I think about is how much data we're going to have that we may get overwhelmed, and how do you shift, sift through the data to get to the things that you really need to know and, and not get overwhelmed. And so that's, you know, it's good to have all the data, but now you've got to figure out how to, how to shift through it and so that, so that uh, you still have an a, a airman in the loop who can take some of that, has time to do some critical thinking, and not have to spend all the time sifting through data. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's really heartening to, to hear that there's progress being made. Data work is really hard, which is why we need people getting PhDs in right. data science and, right. and coming in and applying their talents. Um, another sort of bigger picture, um, Mike asked about, uh, you know, timelines and Taiwan specifically. What is your view of the role of military force in the U.S.-China relationship broadly? How do you think about... Uh, what China's ambitions are, maybe if you have a view of its vision for how it wants to be and behave in the world and, and your perceptions of how they use military force to achieve that and what that means and requires of our military forces in return. Well, there's a couple things I think through is the, um, you know, we often talk about the rules-based international order. Uh, there's those that have talked about, and I think even Secretary Austin's mentioned that they're trying to reshape the order into uh, mm -hmm to their own image or their own liking. Um, I also think about the aspect of the national defense strategy to integrate deterrence. And uh, the PRC is not just looking at things from a military perspective. It's, it is really across the instruments of power we talk about, diplomatic information, military and economic. I, I do think that uh, for the military, um, it's a small M compared to the D-I-N-E. And the uh, information place piece is a, uh, I think, a, <clears throat> another vital point we got to think about, because that changes the perception of uh, allies and partners or uh, uh, countries in the region, uh, how, we, uh, how we all respond to various areas. From the military piece, um, I do think about the aspect of us having a combat credible force. That sends a message, and that can play in the information space. But it helps to back up what we're doing economically as a nation, um, it also helps to back and work in support of our diplomats. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I do think about what we're doing um, 
to make sure we have and stay the most respect, not just the Air Force, but our joint force as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I do pay attention, of course, to what the PRC is doing from a capability standpoint, because I want to make sure we stay ahead of the threat. I can't predict what, uh, you know, the PRC, you know, might do or how they might execute. But I just want to make sure that we have all the capabilities as, you know, as much as possible to provide, to provide options. Thanks. Um, I, I've got a couple more questions um, before we turn over to the audience here, but I also want to express some appreciation for the audience members who submit um, their questions virtually both ahead of time and during the session. I'm going to ask one of those questions from our, from our virtual audience now. Um, and the question is, is what will the future of USAF drone capabilities look like? We're headed down the path to, um, to have a much more capability for uh, on crewed aircraft. When you look at one of our uh, Operation and Paris Next gener uh, Generation Air Dominance Family of Systems, uh, we're going down the path of collaborative combat aircraft. And this collaborative combat aircraft is uh, to be able to fly with, not just with the, with the NGAB, but also looking to see how we can bring that with F-35. And so as we look into our, our future budgets is, um, there's three aspects of this. There's the platform itself. There is the autonomy that goes with it. And then there's how we organize, train, and equip to build the organizations to go. And we're trying to do all those in parallel, so we uh, are thinking through aspects. As you look at a collaborative combat aircraft, um, it can be a, a sensor, it could be a shooter, it could be a jammer. But how does it team with a crewed aircraft? And uh, could you operate it from the back of a KC-46? I mean, we'll have E-7s eventually. Could you operate it from the back of an E-7? Could you operate it from a fighter cockpit? And we're thinking through uh, those aspects. And the other part of that is um, it, it saves on a number of, you know, ex more expensive aircraft you might have in the actual crew. Um, and uh, so we are really headed down that path. And uh, I, I think you'll, you'll see as we start looking at the, our future budgets and the analysis we're doing as part of our operational imperatives that uh, we are committed to more on crew capability. Okay, well, I'm going to ask, I think, the, the two questions that are on everybody's minds um, at the moment. The first has to do with your take on the Super Bowl, because you did mention that you're a, a big NFL fan. But the second is um, about the, um, the events since Friday um, of objects of some shape and size and uh, origin um, traversing airspace and being shot down. Um, I will say that I have a 12-year-old son, and this has very much captured his attention and his imagination. Um, he has a lot of curiosities, um, as I'm sure do a lot of members of the public um, nationwide. Um, and so I'm hoping that you're able to, to share something about how we, um, reading these accounts in the news, can think usefully and productively about what we're seeing and what we should understand about the military response um, as it happens. All right. Uh, well, for the Super Bowl, uh, I was hoping for a good, just <laughs> hoping for a good game because the Cowboys weren't in it. Um, I'm a Cowboys <laughs> fan. Um, the, uh, you know, for the events over the uh, over the past several days and really past couple of weeks, um, we as a as a military have the uh, responsibility for homeland defense, and uh, we we take that seriously. And and so the the events of. Uh, uh, of the high altitude, the very high altitude, that 60,000 feet here that was shot off the coast of South Carolina, um, I think was a, uh, something that got all of our attention um, as we uh, looked at uh, over the course of uh, the past week or so is the you know, better scrutiny of our uh, airspace, um, also the uh, adjusting of the radar um, sensitivities, which means we're seeing more things than we um, would normally see. Um, but we don't... Um, fully appreciate and understand exactly what we're seeing. And so, we, you know, as we try to do the recovery efforts for some of the things that uh, we've shot down, um, uh, we'll, we'll know more. The key part for us is to make sure we are in a position to uh, d defend the United States as well as what we do abroad. And uh, as I said, we, we, we take that part seriously. Uh, my job here is really to provide the capability, organize, train, and equip. And then, uh, in this case, Northcom, General Van Herc at Northcom, uh, uh, NORAD uh, does the operational aspect of the, of the execution. And uh, we want to make sure that he has, again, just like anything else we do for any other combatant command, is ensure that they have uh, all the capabilities to the best of our ability um, to, uh, 
to do what he needs to do to work the homeland defense aspect. Great. Thanks very much. Mike, as a moderator's prerogative, I'll give you one last uh, shot to ask a question before we open it up to the audience, if you have something. I will ask one more thing, which is, General, how do you feel about the trajectory the defense budget is on? Do you feel like we are basically on a good path, getting that 3 to 5 percent real growth that the 2018 National Defense Strategy and the follow-on commission advocated? Do you feel like we're still a little underfunded? You, how do you look at the overall issue as we're now getting into budget season? It's a warm-up question for your yeah. capital. Well, Hill. I mean, you know, F FY23, we, we, you saw what happened there. Uh, I can't forecast what's going to happen in 24. Um, but I do see that we, uh, at least for the Air Force, that there's some positive things from a resourcing standpoint. And I, I'll tell you, no matter what the top line is, we, we've got tough decisions to make. And we've got to make those tough decisions. And, and one of my responsibilities is to make the case for the resources the United States Air Force uh, needs in order to be uh, an effective member of the Joint Force. Um, and um, that's, that's what I'll continue to do. So I, I, feel, I feel pretty positive about the things we're doing. But uh, I also realize that uh, um, as there's dialogue of uh, this particular Congress of uh, potential funding levels, um, I would really uh, not like to see a, a continuing resolution particularly a year-long continuing resolution, because all we do is give our adversaries a year to move forward. Uh, we have a number of new starts in the, in the uh, FY24 budget, and if, those, if we go to a continuing resolution, we can't start those. And uh, we just, we just lose. You, can't, you can't buy back time. Um, and uh, so uh, I, I do think the uh, current events have actually helped to sharpen our focus on, on our adversaries. Uh, February of last year, events of the last week are, are things that uh, you know, bring everybody uh, collectively together. We've, we've got to make sure we're paying attention to what we're doing in, in, uh, with our defense budget and, how, and the aspect of how we spend that money in the defense budget to ensure we uh, have the capabilities that, that are uh, going to best support. Thank you. All right. Well, um, thank you, Chief, for being yeah. available to answer not just our questions but those of our audience as well. Um, we will pass around microphones. If you are called upon to ask a question, you will have one minute to ask your question. At one minute, I will interrupt and move us into the answer part. Um, I would also note that uh, we have talked about the events of the last week, and I'm confident that the chief has shared with us um, all that he can um, about those events. So uh, I would encourage you to think of questions beyond that um, with this opportunity to, to ask him questions directly. Okay, so um, let's start with uh, the Air Force Federal Executive Fellow, uh, who's done his service here this last year. We're happy to have him. Jason, please. Uh, General Brown, thank you for your time. Jason Wolf, Air Force Fellows. My question is, we talked about the new technologies on your Accelerate, Change, or Lose. As we incorporate AI and unmanned systems in the technology, what are the strengths the Air Force can use to recruit and retain the talent in that market space? You know, one, one of the areas that... Uh, I am looking at from a talent uh, management standpoint is how do we make sure that those that have these particular skill sets can do and work with internal of the Air Force? We have a kind of a, a what I would say some traditional paths for uh, individuals, and we have what we call career pyramids that you're probably familiar with, which means these are the squares you've got to fill in order to move up the chain. I want to take a sliver off the side of that and say you've got some special skills. You don't have to follow the same path. I want to make sure that you continue to uh, have the opportunity to do meaningful work, um, opportunities to still get promoted and get pay raises. Uh, maybe you don't move. You stay in the same location for a number of years versus this, our standard three- to four-year cycle of, uh, of movement and um, allow individuals to progress that way, as well as how do we look at that talent to make better connection to, to industry. And so as I look at, for example, our, uh, our various fellowships or education with industry, uh, we talk about sometimes within our uh, talent management, you know, certain uh, uh, career fields say, well, that's the good deal, so when you come back, we got a bad deal for you. No, that is a good deal for development. We want to make sure we develop that talent and put you in positions where you can continue to build and use that talent. So we're looking at how we do our fellowships, how we do education with industry, but how we have a, maybe a different career path, a tech track. As a matter of fact, I just sat down with our personnel team uh, last week. This has been something I've, I've, I've uh, I've uh, given them to solve uh, as we move forward. Um, we're also going to do a little bit with some of those that have very great innovation skills 
and how do we use some of them um, uh, across the Air Force as well and better connect them as well? Because we've got a lot of innovation going on, but I think it's, uh, you know, how do you herd all that innovation and now turn it into a capability? Thanks for the question. Great. Let's see. Let's, um, let's go over here in the front left just to make sure you have to walk the whole distance of the room. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, Brian Everstein with Aviation Week. Great to see you again, General. Good to see you. Um, I was hoping to talk a little bit about ABMS in the context of what we've been seeing lately. Since the beginning of the program, I remember the second on-ramp was a NORTHCOM scenario. We've seen the first capability release transition and acquisition program with CBC2, the cloud-based command and control. Can you talk about what the Air Force has learned about its needs for air domain awareness through this ABMS process, how you're getting after it, and how can you ensure that these programs continue and you look at the long-term need instead of necessarily getting distracted by what's been going on in the past several days? Well, the, the key part here is this is why um, is, you know, Secretary Kendall gave uh, General Cropsey what he says is the toughest job he's ever given anybody. And having sat down, we just sat down here last week uh, with Luke and his team, and I'd agree. Because it is, it's it's taking all the different capabilities we have and figuring out what are the best of breed to build this blueprint of capability that we can move forward. Because we do, as I, as I mentioned just a minute ago, we have a lot of innovation, we have a lot of work, but are they all contributing to move forward? And that's the part uh, where we're going to have to make some some tough decisions um, and be able to take some programs and go, okay, you, thank you for playing. We're taking you and your money and your capability, but we got great work we have for you to to continue to move this forward. So I, I feel, um, actually, I personally feel pretty positive based on uh, where we're headed. It took us a while. I would say maybe it took us a while to get here um, and uh, some experimentation. And that's what the, the on-ramps were. They were more experimentation versus you know, how do we turn this into a capability that we're going to scale. Um, so I, I think we're on, we're on a right path now, and I feel a lot more confident um, because there was a bit of, you know, I'd say in some cases knocking heads with different perspectives, but we've got – really uh, cross-functional teams, and this is Air Force and Space Force working together to be able to move forward. So, I, I, again, I feel pretty, pretty good about where we are right now. Um, in the middle section with the, the salmon-colored necktie, please. Good morning, General. My name is uh, Major Rudy Novak. I'm an Air Force officer as well as a student over at Johns Hopkins Sites across the street. So in 2015, the DOD initiated the third offset strategy. My question is, is this initiative dead, dissolved, has it evolved, or is it still around within the Air Force as the uh, seven operational imperatives? You know, I think it's probably evolved, because I don't hear people talking about third offset, except when I get a question like this. Um, but the, the idea of how do we stay ahead of our adversaries and how we do things asymmetrically is the thing I think about. Because if you look at the, particularly the PRC, um, quantity is one thing, quality and how we execute and the value of our airmen and our NCO core are the things I think about of how that provides a bit of an offset or an asymmetric advantage. Um, and so there is the aspect, of, uh, also say just like I highlighted earlier, how we better work with, with industry in Silicon Valley. I was in Silicon Valley back in December. Uh, I was in Silicon Valley December a year ago, and I, I will tell you, I felt the, in this December, the environment changed, okay, because it was past February of last year. Um, the markets had changed a bit, and there's more of an interest to work with the Department of Defense. Our job now is not to make it so hard to work with us and to break down the barriers and build really strong relationships, because they have an interest in national security just like we do. Uh, I think the uh, Export Control Act and the CHIPS Act also uh, were also uh, things that actually helped to sharpen our attention. And uh, so I think there's aspects of a third offset, not necessarily called a third offset, but the, uh, the approach is, 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 I would say, roughly the same. Taking and using the best of our talent, whether it's in uniform, out of uniform, um, within the government, outside the government, and use that to the, our advantage for national security. All right, come on over here, right into the middle section, sort of a beige jacket. Hi, sir. Thank you. Andy Orr from Shift 5. So kind of dovetailing on that question, some great conversations today about the importance of data. Um, how are you considering Secretary Kendall's operational imperatives, in uh, particular OI7, 
uh, which talks about the readiness and wartime posture to access and, in your words, sift through some of that data as it pertains to your weapon systems? I, you know, I feel, um, I feel pretty good about it, but I think the, there's aspects we don't know what we don't know. And, uh, and this is there, what I mean by that is, um, you know, how we make this better connection, just, just kind of leave, you know, playing off the last question, to those outside of the Air Force that understand how to really operate data. And there's, I mean, there's uh, people inside the Air Force that know how to do this, but not probably to the level that we're probably going to need, which is the reason why I think about and I talk about, if I think about the, the Air Force specialties we have today, there's some that we have today we probably won't need in the future. And there's probably some that we don't have today that we need more of, like data. And how do you start to build out that career field of those capabilities and say these are valuable to the Air Force and build them into and give them a developmental uh, path and a career that we can, they can see themselves up to the higher levels. And so, um, you know, we've got to be able to, you know, how do we bridge that talent between uh, outside of the Air Force and then also build a greater talent internal of the Air Force so we can actually better, better know how to use data. Um, we talk a lot about it, and this is the same thing when we started talking about cyber probably about 15 years ago. We talked a lot about it, we put it on PowerPoint slides until we actually had to start doing it, and then you start to figure out, okay, it's not as simple as a PowerPoint slide, and you've got to dive into the details and work through this. I think it's the same thing as we move into data, um, and there's those that already do it that we can tap into and use their expertise to help teach us how best to do it in, in terms of uh, the Air Force and uh, the Department of Defense. A gentleman here with um, the yellow lanyard band. <laughs> uh, thank you for my next question. Uh, my name is Sang Min, I'm a reporter from Radio Free Asia. I have a question related to the North Korea. Uh, U.S. and South Korea are focusing on the enhancing the effectiveness of U.S. extended deterrence to South Korea in the face of U.S. and North Korean nuclear threats. In that regard, how U.S. efforts involved in enhancing the effectiveness of U.S. extended deterrence to South Korea? Well, you, uh, having served in South Korea twice and uh, understanding of, uh, how things have evolved over, you know, since I first went there in uh, 1987, the, uh, the aspect of extended deterrence uh, uh, still applies. And you think about what we were able, uh, uh, the strength of the alliance between the U United States and Republic of Korea and how rock solid that is. But it's also the capabilities that not only that we have on the peninsula, but the capabilities we have around the world. And when I think about our mission statement for the United States Air Force, it's to fly, fight, and win air power anytime, anywhere. When I talk about anytime, anywhere, we have the capability to have that extended deterrence range around the world. Um, to include uh, with the Republic of Korea on the peninsula. And that uh, is uh, all part of what we are able to, particularly with our, with our bomber fleet uh, in, in particular, is, is what I'd offer. And so it's, it's how we work extended deterrence um, with all the capabilities we have um, to, to demonstrate not just with the, with the Air Force but with the joint team, but also having watched the Republic of Korea Air Force and its uh, work over the years uh, as well. Matter of fact, the, uh, the Air Chief is someone that when I was at Kunsan, as a colonel, we were there together at Kunsan. We know each other in a strong relationship, not only between our Air Forces, but uh, personally as well. Let's uh, come up here in the front. Uh, yeah, Peter Samuel, Kaplan. Let's, hold on, I'll get you a microphone, please. Thanks. Uh, Peter Samuel with Capital Intelligence, BBN. My question is, um, we know, I mean, everybody's noticed that this balloon issue has really distracted all public attention from the Russian uh, offensive in Ukraine. Um, do you think that was intentional or is it a coincidence? I, I would say probably more a coincidence. I mean, uh, you know, there may be the public attention may be shifted. Our attention has it yeah. as a department. And so, uh, I mean, we've got to be able to do, um, you know, as for our security, security with our allies and partners. You know, as I say, we've got to walk and be able to walk and chew gum at the same time uh, and have the capability to, to be able to do both. And that's, that's what we're doing, is staying uh, focused on, you know, um, you know, both and really everything else that's going on around the world uh, as well. Um, the young lady up here in the front, please. 
Brianna Riley with CQ Roll Call. Good to see you again, sir. Base resilience is one of Secretary Kendall's seven operational imperatives, but how do you see the Air Force striking the balance between recapitalizing existing bases and leveraging new investments in sort of this expanded site uh, announcement that we saw in the Philippines recently? Um, I'm just curious sort of what kind of investments are needed to ensure these new sites can be used to their full potential to achieve goals in the region. Thanks. Well, part, part of our resilient basing piece is, um, you know, we think about how we you know, first have some basic capability, how we preposition, but also how do we assess at each of the locations that we might uh, consider and having that access at various locations. And the recent announcement in the Philippines provides additional opportunities for access. Um, I'll just go back to my, my time as a PACAP commander. That, the, those additional ECA sites were actually a conversation even back then. And to see that uh, we are um, in a position now to move forward provides an opportunity and then we, you know, as we uh, start to lay in resources. And so as we lay in our resources, when you look at the uh, operational imperative five and resilient basing, they're not location specific. So, I mean, there is some location specific uh, type things. We want to do some location agnostic to buy the capabilities that we can put in various places to, go, uh, to be able to execute. All right, in the middle section, a gentleman with a blue shirt and I think a blue tie. Yes, that, you got it. Since we've mentioned uh, Ukraine, and there's a lot of talk about improving and upgrading the level of various pieces of equipment we give them, how long does it take to train a, uh, like a Ukrainian pilot who used to flying Soviet era stuff into much more Western uh, aircraft? You know, that's, that, I don't know the answer to that, but I will just tell you, just based on how we operate and how we train our, um, our fighter pods who go from one fighter aircraft to another. Uh, depending on the, uh, the aircraft, um, it takes anywhere from, you know, two to, two to six months. And that's, um, that's typically when we, you know, we have our transition courses from, like when uh, we were trying to Air 4, a number of uh, pilots were coming to F-16, it was about a two to, two to four month course. And so that's kind of the model that, uh, um, at least the way we operate in terms of the United States Air Force. I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, another gentleman over here on the edge with a navy blue jacket and I think a purple tie. Hi, sir. Jake Pergandy from Mulvey Center. A uh, question for you. The Goldwater Nichols acted as like a forcing function to evolve the military into a joint force. Do you see the services and more importantly the Air Force being able to do that next evolution that you talk about organically or do you see a legislative action for, as like a forcing function to produce that evolution? No, I, I think there's things we can do organically but um, sometimes a little, uh, little push every once in a while helps. Um, but the other part, we want to make sure, and this is one of the things I've tried to do, and one of the key words I had in like Solar Change or Lose is the word collaboration. And that collaboration is my engagement with members of Congress and their staffs so we can talk through things so you don't necessarily have to have a forcing function. And uh, understand what they're looking for for the Department of Defense to do. They understand what I'm trying to do with the Air Force uh, and then also as part of the joint team and having those conversations because we, we don't want is, a, uh, is legislation that makes it really, really hard to actually execute or is broader than we're going to be able to, to do. And that dialogue, um, is, I think, is really important because they get a sense of where I'm sitting, where I'm coming from, and vice versa. And then how do we work more closely together to be able to move things forward um, with, without uh, you know, legislation? Now, legislation, they, you know, I'm not going to tell them exactly what to do, but I'm going to give them some advice. And, but I also want to get their advice as well. I want to get some things of how they see us and maybe it's just, uh, you know, we may be talking past each other until we sit in a room and start having a conversation. And that's to me is the value of engaging. And I think that's why we are, when I think about our, you know, approach bill in the NDA for 23, because of the engagements, I spend a lot of time with meeting with members. Uh, just to me, it's very, very important in their staffs to be able to understand. They understand where we're going and I understand what their concerns are and we can help work, work this together. And I think that's, that's important. All right, we'll go um, to the middle section, navy blue tie, gray jacket. Hey, sir, Major Tony Ferrara, Air Force Fellow at uh, the Center for Security and Emerging Technology. Uh, I wanted to, to mention, you, you, so you discussed transitions earlier in relationship to the acquisition of mission systems. Um, I'd like to ask you about operational risk. When you consider the role of autonomous systems and CCAs and 
and uh, next generation air dominance. How is the department considering the operational risk to investing in these technologies? Are there roles that we are maybe uncomfortable delegating to this untested technology, given maybe we may only have one shot? Um, and just one example is we've heard everything from small and attributable to flying in formation with F-35s, which sound very different in terms of their roles. Thank you, sir. Well, I think it's a range. Matter of fact, I was sitting down with one of my counterparts, and he, uh, we talked about if you look at a cost, at what point do you say this is no longer attributable? Because you're putting so much uh, capability into it, you're spending so much money, and then you go, okay, that that's uh, you, you want to get that one back. And so we get really got to think through how we define these. And these are very right now; these are very broad terms. I think the more we we work through the process of developing the capability, um, but also being uh, pragmatic about how we do this, so you don't try to put everything on a uh, collateral combat aircraft, and then now it becomes, you know, almost as expensive as the air, the crewed aircraft. There's a bit of balance of, of, of how, we, uh, how we go through that. There's got to be some levels of risk. Okay, just think about the, how in, outside of the Air Force and outside the department, um, when I go out to Silicon Valley, for example, there's a lot of failure out there, but they're, they're failing forward. And that's the things we're going to have to be able to do is to think about, hey, there is some risk there. It may not work exactly, but we're going to learn something with each evolution as we, as we go forward. And uh, I think that's the way we've got to continue to think about it, how we, uh, we, particularly with these collateral combat aircraft. We will do one more. Um, and let's go to the gentleman over here, please. Thank you, Chief Chad Mansky, retired Air Force. Good morning. Thanks Good morning. for your time. You just recently added a couple things to your professional development reading list, and I was wondering if you could talk about those and maybe a book or two that you've recently read or dived into and, and uh, how that impacted you and uh, what we could get out of something like that. Thank you. Well, one of my challenges here is I, uh, I don't get to read. I get good recommendations from my, uh, matter of fact, the guy who does all that sitting right back there in the, in the back. Uh, but we talk about the kinds of things that I want to be able to used to connect. And what I've really tried to do with my uh, leadership library versus a reading list is because not everybody takes information the same way, which is why I do books, podcasts, and documentaries. Um, and, um, you, know, the, um, you know, one of the books that we, uh, I think we had on early on that still really resonates with me is uh, No Rules Rules, The Culture and Reinvention of Netflix. Um, I'm not even sure if that's on the list. Is it, is it Seth? It's not. It, it, it probably will be at some point. Um, but you know, we, we picked these based on um, feedback and input from our, our staff. You know, my goal was to try to read all of them as I put them on there, and that was pretty aspirational. <laughs> um, but I try to connect to things that uh, our airmen are, are really interested in and really to be able to take a look at the spectrum of, of topics that go across my action orders. You know, A for airmen. B on bureaucracy, uh, you know, C on competition, and, uh, and D on design implementation, and how we use those to, uh, uh, to break down barriers. I wish I had my list in front of me so I could actually pick one, because uh, I've, I've read a few of them, but I'm trying to think of one that I've read here recently. Um, I'm in the middle of uh, the book by Jay McCall on it, kind of, it's, it, I can't remember the name of it, but it's really about reimagining the future, and how do you look at yourself and, and put yourself 10 years in the future and what, would you, what kind of things would you be thinking about 10 years in the future? Um, and you might ha take a different perspective versus kind of where you sit today, you know, and, and kind of uh, future casting where you put yourself in the future and then kind of look, look backwards to where you are today and, to, and how do you get to that, that future uh, version of yourself or whatever the, the uh, scenario is. And we're currently lobbying for military history in the mo for the modern strategist to be on the reading list, so, so stay tuned for that. I, I can't let you go without asking one more thing. We talk a lot about um, challenges and impediments and threats um, and current events and all of those things, but you have a really interesting and important job right now, and I hope that you would be willing to share with us something that's felt like a big win for you, something that's been great about this job, uh, something that you reflect on uh, that exceeded your expectations, anything uh, in that sort of um, good news category of things? There's a couple, there's a handful of things. Um, the traction with Accelerate Change or Lose with our airmen, um, 
And when I go out and they talk about um, the, the feedback I get from a number of them, how much they appreciate the aspect of trying to drive change, trying to break down bureaucracy, trying to delegate down to the lowest capable and competent level. Uh, that, that, when I get feedback from our airmen, uh, when I have members of Congress saying accelerate change or lose, when I go to testify, okay, that's, a, that's a bit of a win because they understand why we need to change. Um, the other things, um, I, the change in our doctrine to mission command, uh, we redid that uh, April, uh, a year ago, almost, it'll be, it's almost two years ago. But just the concept of how do we provide intent to our airmen, how we trust them, and how we empower them. And using that as a way to change the culture of the Air Force. Because if we get into a future contingency or conflict, what I really want our airmen to do is be com confident that they can make decisions and do things at the lower level uh, without having to come back and ask for permission. Because I don't have time to sign permission slips for everything we do. I want to provide intent and let them go execute. And they will probably do more than I ever imagined because I give them the opportunity. And they will look at the problem differently than I might. But I've got to give them some, some, some guidelines uh, to move forward. Um, I think we've made some progress on, uh, on our diversity, inclusion, equity, um, and accessibility. Um, I, I chair a diversity and inclusion council. And it's really trying to break down barriers so every one of our airmen, no matter who they are, can achieve their full potential. Um, uh, I think we made progress on the, on the uh, NDA in, in the appropriate bill. Uh, we're going to retire A-10s for the first time. It's been something we've been trying to do for a number of years. <laughs> um, and uh, it's because of the environment's changed as well. Um, but it's the fact that I can see that the, there's a bit of momentum on, on, on driving change and how well that's resonating with our airmen. Um, and how that is resonating with members on, on the Hill as well. Uh, that, to me, has been uh, positive. Uh, the last thing I'd, me, I'd say on that is I don't care that my name is associated, to be honest with you. Uh, I want to do things that are going to be enduring well after I'm gone. And they can look back. And someone, if someone wants to look back and go, C.Q. Brown was part of that, fine. But uh, I just want to make our Air Force as capable as possible and leave it. Because uh, one day I'm going to retire. And I want to be able to sit back like Chad Mansky here and uh, be relaxed because we've got great airmen that are doing um, great work. And I want to make sure that I'm doing everything I can to, to make them successful. Well, Chief, on behalf of Mike and myself, um, sincere thanks for coming to share your thoughts, your insight, and your experiences with the Brookings audience. This is a really valuable period of time to get to spend with you. So thank you very much. And thank you, audience. Um, we hope you'll join another Brookings event soon. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. And don't forget to buy the book.